and the last yeah. artist is uh, yeah. Abdel Hadi Gazar. Um, so Abdel Hadi Gazar, like uh, Mahmoud Mukhtar, uh, came from a kind of uh, underprivileged uh, background, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had the first period, uh, right, where he started depicting um, the scenes that he saw, that he experienced uh, in his uh, neighborhood of, uh, of uh, can you remind me the district? Uh, uh, yeah, Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab, yeah, in yeah. Cairo. Mm. So, yeah, I wouldn't say, so uh, Mokhtar comes from an agricultural family and uh, it, um, his father wasn't a big part of his life and he moved with his mother and sisters to Cairo when he was a boy. Um, but Gazar comes from an, um, I mean, it's called like middle class background. So his father was, uh, worked at Al Azhar University. Yeah. So was uh, educated, an educated religious person. So, um, yeah, not from the like super wealthy elite. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it comes from a, a urban educated background, um, and so at first he, he turns to, um, and I don't think you have, um, so if you go back to the, the yeah. image before, yeah. yeah. So this kind of early stage, I would say this is, this is very early. This to me looks um, like even before he turns to the mystical Islamic mm. references of the Sayyid Zainab area. So in the late 1940s, he experimented a lot with what he called the primal stage, yeah. um, which was these kind of originary forms. Uh, sometimes they look like cave paintings. Sometimes they look like surrealist um, automatic drawings, uh, very, a lot of big bodies in space male and female bodies so here right there's a fish <laughs> and some overlapping is a couple of fish and some overlapping bodies um and so this this would i would say this is kind of from his primal stage mm-hmm. uh period uh and these are not these, these there're not a lot of paintings that come out of this there are a lot of drawings so this might have also been um overlapping when he was a student at the school of fine arts so that school that we talked about at the beginning still in existence today mm-hmm. by the 1940s it's become Kuleyat al funun al gamila mm-hmm. so um changed its name to arabic <laughs> uh, didn't last in french for very long mm-hmm. um so he is a student there and it's a very tra- traditional um curriculum still today but then he is part of the contemporary art group which is a small collective of artists that we could call post-surrealists. So they weren't part of the surrealist art and freedom group. They were a little too young. Um, So the art and freedom group gets started in 1937. And by the late 1940s, it's kind of disbanded, but the influence, the legacy of them is still around. So the contemporary art group was really interested in getting back to, uh, they they were interested in truth in art and moving away from academic technique to find truth and again this is something that you know is very common all over the world you know definitely a surrealist idea you know to move away from the highly illusionistic to the insane to the unconscious to the childlike to the to the primitive even um this idea of the primitive so here getting to the primal stage is this kind of way of unlocking some some higher truth Mm -hmm. Um, and so here, and then after this, in the late 40s, early 50s, he turns to the mystical images. Yeah. Um, so kind of in between these two paintings. Yeah, between, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> and then in the 50s and 60s, in the 50s, he starts turning away from images of these mystical practices in the Islamic quarters of Cairo towards international more kind of universal internet universal but worldwide global images of science and technology yeah. and so 
Um, one really important thing that happens in his life is that he goes to Italy for four years to study at the Central Restoration Institute. Mm -hmm. um, so from the archive, there are archives that's like kind of unclear why he gets placed <laughs> at the Central Restoration Institute, but I think one of the reasons he doesn't go to yeah. England or France at this time is because of the Suez Canal crisis. So the Suez Canal crisis is a big military um, um, disagreement between Egypt and France and uh, Britain. And so those kind of diplomatically are off limits. So he goes to Italy instead. And a lot of the artists in the, in the 50s, um, Egyptian, there's a big contingent of Egyptian artists and Syrian artists, when Egypt and Syria are united, they go to Italy. Um, so okay. it's kind of a heyday for Egyptian artists and Syrian artists in Italy at that, in the late 1950s. But he starts to ch change his perspective. I think that there's a increasing disillusionment with the promises and optimism of the of Arab nationalism and Nasser at this time, as well as just an opening up of horizons, you know, and and the increasing importance of science and te technology in within the Cold War context, you know, and then I think just this fascination um, with the space race. So yeah. the space race and science become really important. And he's studying because he's in the Restoration Institute. Um, one of these benefits of befriending the family was I got to see his notebooks um, and he took science class, chemistry and um, yeah. other types of science classes because you have when you're doing restoration, you have to know the science. And so he was very, um, and he got very high marks <laughs> all of his, in all of his classes. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this term, maybe, you know, influenced by the science that he's taking at school um, in this program or this new global discourse about science and technology within the Cold War. But I still see that even though he's switching kind of the content, that he still maintains an interest in enchantments um, as a way to unlock truth in, in art. Um, and so here, you know, in the background, that kind of, he develops this style of this man, uh, magical machines, these kind of weaving interconnected wires and right. pipes and pulleys and it doesn't make any sense I mean it's not like an actual rendering of a, of a mechanical structure but that kind of um, the enchantment of of technology as being kind of this this you know modern day mystical um, production of, hu of of humanity and that kind of you know how I think you know for all of our you know, parents and grandparents who lived through the space a space race in the 50s and 60s. It was such a magical and sure. enchanting um, period of, you know, being able to go to outer space was this crazy, mm -hmm. this crazy thing that, you know, no one had ever dreamed of before. And so I think even though, you know, he's moving from images of Al-Khidr, the green man, this mystical Islamic figure to a scientist, it's kind of a similar, a, there's a, he maintains that interest in enchanting Mm. enchanting processes so that was uh, um, an introduction for these uh, three uh, artists and their works but in one of your chapters um, you you focused on the representation of uh, the female peasant in works uh, paintings or uh, sculptures so from Mahmoud Said or Mahmoud Mukhtar and a lot of uh, Egyptian artists uh, use this uh, female figure uh, in their in their works um, can you tell us about this um, uh, symbolic of uh, I mean this symbol of uh, the peasant uh, woman and also uh, can you explain it, the evolution, as you wrote in your book, the evolution of this uh, image from a colonial image to a nationalist uh, image? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here in this fifth chapter, I chose a different person rather than doing a deep dive onto one particular artist. I focus instead on um, a very particular image that is repeated over and over again here, I go through about 200 years. And what it shows is that the, this 
you know, the, the kind of main, one of the main arguments of the book is about constellational modernism and how um, these artworks are referencing a network of connections, primarily in the Mediterranean. And so this image of the peasant with the, specifically the peasant with the water jug is kind of bounces back and forth within colonial and post-colonial imagery of Egypt. Um, and it shows how easily images move um, from colonial images to post-colonial images from European production into Egyptian and that kind of stark divide between East-West, you know, that we maybe would have been more attached to in the 20th century is really, it was much more fluid, actually in practice was very fluid. Uh, and so here I take up this image of the woman in the water jug. So she's very important. You know, we've seen that you showed the Mahmoud Mokhtar um, yeah. sculpture in the beginning. So that, you know, I, I thought, well, where did she come from? <laughs> she's everywhere, especially yeah. in photography. Mm -hmm. It's just like so many images of women with water jugs. I'm like, what is going on? Like, yeah. why, why are there so many of them? Um, and then I, so I went back. So this is an image, this is kind of from the middle of the chapter um, on photography. So this image of the woman with the water jug here, this is a studio print from around 1880. Um, so this would have been taken, This, you know, obviously is there's a backdrop and fake grass on the ground, yeah. but this photographer, Hippolyte Arnaud, who originally went to Egypt to document the opening of the Suez Canal is here creating these images of types. Um, so this is very popular for travelers who would go to Egypt. They would go to the photo studio and they would select. If you see on the bottom right, there's a little yeah. number under, it says Arno in white, which means he, he wrote that on the negative, on the glass negative. Okay. And then there's a number, 1167. So uh, he, the, the negatives would be numbered and then you would go, because it was too expensive to have your own camera, you would go to the photo studio and you'd say, okay, well, I want a picture of the pyramids and a picture of the Nile and a picture of the Suez Canal and a picture of, you know, this peasant woman to kind of commemorate, be like your, you know, souvenir from your trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so these images of peasant women with water drugs are ubiquitous in this period. Um, but she goes back much further. So I locate her, I can, the earliest that I can find are from the 18th century uh, in engravings. Um, so an earlier version, an earlier method of reproducible image technologies that comes before photography. Uh, and I, I argue that she kind of picks up meaning along the way. At first, this kind of type um, is very common, you know, across colonial imagery of the whole world. Uh, colonial image producers were very interested in documenting the different types of people and in particular their clothing. So whether they're in South America documenting indigenous populations there or in China or in India, um, there's always this, well, this is like this kind of person and this is what they wear and this is what, yeah. this is <laughs> what they wear. Um, and so she kind of starts out as a uh, ethnographic type or even a fashion type you know it was like what kind of clothing she wears but she becomes more potent as she as, as the years go on um, and she gets picked up um, by uh, new for, for first she's in engravings and then and lithography and then goes into orientalist painting becomes a very crucial figure in orientalist painting as a symbol of Egypt. And I see that, I, I think that this potency comes from the fact that she's carrying the water jug and that it symbolizes the power of the water mm -hmm. in Egypt. And so that the kind of worry or anxiety of a lot of the people in power in Egypt in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was around these very powerful waterways, the Nile and how it floods every year, which is, you know, one of the reasons it's the longest agricultural region in the entire, you know, longest surviving agricultural region in the entire world are these floods, um, the Mediterranean coast, and of course the Suez Canal. So there's this kind of um, focus on the water as the one of the most important resources in Egypt. Both, that, both as a way to move people and goods, but also 
um, the, again, going back to that idea from Saeed, the fertility of, of the woman is a representation of the fertility of the agricultural region, which again, you know, um, was, a, was and is an important, yeah. an important thing for anybody who is um, in control of Egypt. As it's, now we see there's a lot of discourse now about the Nile and, um, uh, you know, Sudan and Ethiopia, you know, wanting to dam parts of the Nile because Egypt basically like sucks all of the resources of yeah. the Nile from the whole region. You know, I think there's still this, um, this um, so from anxiety a, a, for the water. colonial image to something more um, related to an uh, artistic identity. Uh, how did the uh, Egyptian modern artist uh, appropriate this uh, image of the, of the female uh, peasant? Right. So when she, right. So when, um, by the time you get to the 20th century, this is a very, very established image already uh, that are, that symbolizes Egypt. And so they're able to kind of, she's kind of like, um, a cipher, like a, an image that can easily be detached from its previous it you know context you know she's no longer it's no longer like a documentary image of a person getting water from the Nile right yeah. she you got to be like it's an image that can become detached from that original context um, but it still maintains you know the in, immediate recognizability as a symbol of Egypt but then here you know Mokhtar and Said seem to be playing with that image and using it as a place to I think both of them are very interested in form and uh the materiality of their of their art and they're using a her and this image you know immediately it says you know it's recognizable as egypt and then they use it as a place to further develop those formal qualities um so you know the beautiful this is a great painting <laughs> so fun so yeah so uh, yeah. Mahmoud Said, we so we see the nile uh, yeah uh, behind the the woman and the jug again. Yeah. yeah, but then he, you know, he's uh, the flowers on her, you know, that's a new thing, right? So it's not always depicted with this floral, these beautiful, this floral motif on her. Um, so I would, I would bet that um, the flowers on her dress are, have heavy impasto. Mm -hmm. Like they're very crescent. So like Mahmoud Sayyid, it's so hard to see it in reproduction. Um, but uh, usually these parts of red and white you know, will have like a lot of crusty buildup of oil paint on them. Um, they're kind of almost sculptural. And so it's kind of a, an excuse to just be very painterly and kind of revel in the, in the oil paint and the process of making, of making the image. So, you know, it doesn't be, I mean, this is not a portrait. This is like not a specific person no. <laughs> um, from his family. It's very symbolic of Egypt, but then it also becomes a place where he can explore the properties of oil painting. Just like with Mokhtar, she kind of becomes, the sculpture becomes a place to explore the properties of bronze sculpture or marble sculpture and the, well, the, the possibilities of that while, while always maintaining that nationalist connection to Egypt simply through um, the image of the peasant and the water jug. Mm -hmm. Uh, my last question for you is uh, that you worked on Egyptian modernism, but you also um, uh, put emphasis on the idea of, uh, I mean, how important uh, Islam or Islamic culture, tradition, uh, is a, a constitutive aspect of this uh, Egyptian modernism. Uh, I'd like to, to know like how now Egyptian modernism fits in uh, uh, global uh, modernism. Oh, okay. Those are two really big questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was really important. This, the, the role of Islam in modern Egyptian art is really important to 
note for the American context. You know, I'm an American scholar. I teach in an American institution. I teach American students. And uh, it's really important to identify and understand that the religion of Islam, which is so often in American media painted in stark, stark um, opposition to American culture a lot of the times, or, you know, it, it, or it, as a monolithic thing that is, cannot be changed. Uh, you know, that the Islam is one thing and there's only one way to see it and there's only one way that it is expressed and there's no diversity. You know, a lot of times it's kind of the overarching impression that the, that the American media gives here. And so it was really important for me to note that here the religion is present. It's part of the culture, but it is not the dominant feature of this modernism at all. Mm -hmm. But it's not absent either. You know, this is not a purely secularist. Um, um, you know, most of the images that we that you showed today didn't have a lot of the um, didn't have a lot of references to the Islamic content context. But you know, Ghazar, his father was an Al Azhar professor, and um, he definitely engages. He most specifically engages with that with that heritage. But um, Saeed and Mukhtar do as well. And so the, the point is that it's there, it's present, it's part of the modernity, um, it's part of this modern movement, but it's not the defining factor. And that's okay. Like we can yeah. have something that we're, and I think, you know, you, you live in Beirut, like, you know, you know, I mean, you live in this part of the world, you know, that the religion can be present in your everyday life, but it's not the defining factor of your everyday life. And, and I think that that is very it actually goes against uh, what what is presented in mainstream me media and what is replicated a lot of times within art history, these divisions within our history that we have a whole field called Islamic art and that we think that, you know, the kind of general consensus, a lot of scholars today are pushing back on it, but the general consensus is that this, this field of Islamic art should only have art that really like, um, looks islamic that has yeah. calligraphy or you know doesn't have giant naked women yeah. <laughs> you know that seems to be a, an mm -hmm. oxymoron and my point is that it's not you know that these things that Mokhtar, saeed gazar they all come out of this context where islam is part of the culture but is not the defining factor of that culture and that kind of nuance and diversity uh is something that is not often identified within the mainstream here and so it was really important for me to to pinpoint that so many so we have this new field of global modern art history uh, that is beginning to blossom mm -hmm. uh, over the last decade and will continue there are many younger scholars you know barring any extreme impact of the current um, COVID crisis on scholarship. Uh, these these projects will continue, and um, it's a it's a really exciting field. And but most of it has been focused on particular countries, cities. Uh, has not been comparative. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Egypt is a really important movement i think that it was very big and it was very well connected because of egypt's outsized role in 20th century political and cultural connections in the mediterranean and in the arab world and in the post-ottoman world it was a very important place and there were a lot of people going through there was a lot of money and support for the arts and so you have you know a robust there's a robust movement um, and so there's a lot of, I find that there's a lot of similarities between Egypt, what's going on in Egypt and India. Like I, I, that for me is a more productive comparative framework than, um, than maybe, a, you know, Egypt and another part of the Arab world, just because the colonial situation in India was kind of um, similar to what was going on in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and so with the British, you know, with a British colonial presence, um, but a really, really important 
part of that of the empire um so i i think that egypt is a really but you know in a comparative framework i think there's more work to do like so the, the next step so we have a lot of um very specific studies of different regions in of global modernism and then the next step is to kind of put these in a more comparative comparative framework um but that takes a lot of it takes a lot of work and so because the amount of expertise you need linguistically historically or art historically in any one country or city or region it's very hard to get that kind of expertise in two in, in two let alone three so there have been a few attempts to compare um different areas of the world but it, it sometimes it falls flat if the if the um, person who is writing it isn't super familiar or well researched in that in that area so mm -hmm. there's more there's more work i think i think it's one of the most i mean i think it's one of the most important ones <laughs> um but uh but i think you know I, um there's more work to be done to say how does it fit and this idea of constellational modernism that i present in the book but was one way that i wanted to establish that you know a way in which to compare egypt with other parts of the world so I'm confident that this idea of constellational modernism works for Egypt, but I haven't, you know, we, I haven't yet seen, well, is it the same thing going on in India or yeah. Mexico or Japan or um, Brazil? You know, I haven't yet applied it somewhere else. Um, but the idea was that it was a model that could hypothetically be applied to other places. Thank you so much for joining this panel. And, um, you're welcome in Beirut and uh, if you want to visit the foundation, it would be a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thanks for your great questions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.